Hello, Internet. It is I, David Hewlett, and... Uh, Q-Dragon, I guess. <laughs> you guess. He's not sure. Today, we're not sure whether it's Q-Dragon or not. I know. And today we're going to talk about this Stella Young TED Talks that I saw. That really, I should have, I, I, I don't know whether I entirely agree with it, but I, I, I found it very interesting. So I'm going to suggest that everyone goes and watches that video now just to get a sense of what we're talking about. And then come back and, uh, and listen to us rattle on about it. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a Community Achievement Award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice, but there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. So Stella Young is, um, or I should say was, this is the other thing that I found, I didn't realize that she had died. She died last year. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, this is the weird thing. I had this one of these weird sort of, only in this new wired world would this happen. I, I was looking at her Twitter feed and it just stopped. And I thought, oh boy, so she's being trolled or someone has, because she was scared about, not scared, but she admitted to being a little sort of freaked out by the number of sort of, you know, troll comments that could come out of things that she said, because she's quite outspoken. And I thought, oh, a troll has scared her off Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then I looked and realized that she'd actually, she died of an aneurysm last December. And I was really quite sort of shocked because you're looking at this timeline on Twitter. You're watching all these little very vibrant posts and plans and everything. And then it just stops. And it seems, I, I'm, if I'm mistaken, you know, obviously let me know. But I, it sounds like it was nothing related to, to her, her brittle bone condition. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, was, it was an aneurysm. So, so Stella Young, she was a, I'm going to check my notes. Um, Stella Young, she was a journalist. She was a TV interviewer. And she called herself a disability activist. Um, and a cripple. She used to call herself a cripple, too, which was, of course, shocked and offended many, many people. Uh, I, uh, I, must, I must warn you, I do drop the old C-bomb a little bit in my comedy sometimes. Um, and I feel the need to warn people because people get a little bit offended. But, look, I just, I really love the word cripple. So, and it makes people uncomfortable. This gentleman down the front looks like he really wishes I'd said The condition she had was, was called osteogenesis imperfecta, OI, and it's, it's basically brittle bone disease. Her bones, if she, you know, she choked on a chip once and coughed and broke a, broke a, a rib. Um, and then in another interview, which I, quite, I thought was quite amusing, she, she confessed to getting drunk with her friends and falling out of her chair and breaking her arm. <laughs> so she was a real character. Not to sort of overgeneralize, but I would say, having been to Australia, the Australians are fantastic at saying exactly what's on their mind and not sugarcoating it at all. Um, maybe it's something about living amongst all those dangerous animals or something, but, but they're just wonderfully uh, sort of frank with you for the most part. And as I say, I mean, you can't generalize about an entire country, but um, not all Canadians are, uh, are polite and lovely, as it seems as I can attest The topic of this was, you know, I am not your inspiration. And uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, general thoughts. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think here? I don't necessarily entirely agree with her stance, uh, but I think it is closer to a good stance than I generally see. Hmm. That is a, a good mentality for, you know, the general population of disabled people that, you know, pretty much we just deal with whatever our situation is. And, you know, that's not necessarily something extraordinary or inspirational. And, you know, then that's, that's that. Uh, you know, one area where I, I did disagree with her is that, you know, some of the stuff is kind of impressive. Is kind of? Impressive. Hmm. Like when she said when she was talking about giving different examples of what people would show in like the inspirational images, hmm. and be like, you know, that's not impressive. That's just people dealing with what they have, and in certain situations, that's the case. I guess it again, it really sort of depends on the specific person. Hmm. 
Yeah, again, it's, you can't generalize. Like, not all Australians are outspoken and frank. Mm. So, you know, I felt that in a way she was generalizing mm. sort of in the other direction. Hmm. Well, first off, I'd never heard anything like it. And I felt guilty because I, you know, I do, you know, certainly when we met, you know, I, I did find you inspiring, if that makes sense. Like, wow, look at this kid, he's doing this stuff. And the reality is that is such a strangely selfish kind of a, that's very actor in a way. It's all about me, you know. Um, and I just thought it was really refreshing to hear someone say like, no, look, you know, obviously don't. The, the merits are not us dealing with disabilities. The merits are what we've accomplished, like what, what we've accomplished as people, not as people with disabilities. One example that I sort of thought of hmm. is Stephen Hawking. Yeah. It would not and be beyond the realms of possibility that somewhere outside of our own universe lies another different universe. And in that universe, Zane is still in one direction. <laughs> and the fact that he writes as much as he does, given how hard it is for him to type, that is impressive. But yeah. I feel like it's a little more impressive given his situation. Yes. No, I like, agree. I... I have a much easier time typing, and I'm not as smart, obviously, but I could write other things just as much, but I don't. Because I'm lazy. A great point that she made that I thought she was very clever with was she said, we all deal with ourselves within the limitations of who we are, of our physical limitations. So, like, and to me, that speaks to the whole sort of robotic cyborg attitude. But, you know, some people, and they're on a disability, do you have a lot more limitations. Like, I, you know, I don't think it's fair to say you are disabled compared to an Olympic athlete, mm. because in theory, you could become an Olympic athlete. Mm. Well, I don't, well, no, I would, but I would argue, I would argue that no, I'm not, because I don't have the genetics for it. You know, I mean, I don't have the long legs, I don't have the, you're, we're practically, you know, we're, they're picking people who are specifically designed for what they're good at, and I'm saying technology eventually could allow us to run as fast as they can, to, and yet there's a stigma attached to that. There's, for some reason, it's okay to quote unquote fix people, but it's not okay to improve them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know what that is. I don't know whether that's sort of a, st a sanctity of the human form, or whether that's just fear of people, of, of there being even larger differences between people who the haves and the have-nots. Because the reality yeah. is, the way the world is going right now, the more money you have, the healthier, the, the, the more technology is going to be available to you, the longer you'll live, potentially. Um, and I guess people's fear is that that's going to run away and get, and get away from us. Yeah. It's, it's a discussion that we've had before because you've said in the past that you don't like the idea of people making their lives about their disabilities. Yes. Yeah. Um, that your, your whole point is like you want to do something. That yeah, who exactly. gives a crap whether I'm disabled or not? I, I want to I want to work in robotics. I want to you know I want to work in I want to design you know bio uh, medical uh, technologies and stuff. I mean, and by doing something, you accomplish something. The thing I loved about her at the beginning of Stella's speech was when she talked about her parents being approached uh -huh. to give her an achievement award. And they're like, well, she yeah. hasn't done anything. <laughs> you know, she watches doors yeah, and creeps. I thought that was cute because I think that is definitely a tendency. There's a sort of an overcompensation. I think on the uh, on the non-disabled, as I love, I love, I just love that suddenly the way she again she the way she the way she turned sort of political correctness on its head. I thought was yeah. was interesting. And what, now, what do you make of the two different concepts of disability? That there was a medical disability and then there was a social disability. Yeah. Um. Again, I don't think either of those is entirely accurate. Mm. And yeah, I think she was sort of. Making a few generalizations. Because, mm. like, like you said at the end, no amount of sort of personal or societal acceptance makes things accessible. Yeah, she's that, makes things easier. She's that great quote of like, you know, it doesn't matter how hard I smile at that set of stairs, they're not going to turn into a ramp. Exactly. Um, so, and obviously, society can you know, could restructure itself to make things easier. Mm. But again, it also, I would say, it entirely depends on 
technology. Mm. Because for someone, say, who has a uh, missing leg, mm. they can currently essentially go back to normal human function. Yes. Yeah, there's there... someone in her situation, or in my situation, or even more serious situations, just can't. And it doesn't matter how much society has accepted that kind of situation. Mm. Well, it's a societal change, too. I mean, the reality is, you know, as, as medicine gets better and better at keeping people alive in any, in, you know, in any, with any condition, you know, I think the, the look and the function of society will change as well. I mean, you know, I, I, there's, I, I think there will, there will have to be infrastructure changes. My, 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 my thing was always, I remember someone was talking about the, the tube um, in London and saying how it's got to be more accessible to, to people with disabilities. And, um, and I just sort of started going like, how do you, I just don't know the, like, the logistics of having to make all of those ancient stations work. Would it not be easier, better, I don't know, to create systems that allow the individual to traverse the stairs that they've had to deal with, mm. that they have to deal with. I don't, I don't know. Like I, I don't, I'm asking yeah. rather than saying. I, I would almost want to hybridize those two views on disability into, so let's make some stuff up right now, um, mm. into the technological view of disability. Mm. Uh, dis disability is entirely dependent on three key factors. Mm. The actual medical condition, how society perceives it, and the current level of technology. Right. Well, that's like Hugh Hare says, the amazing the pioneer in, in, in prosthetics. Uh -huh. He was saying that, that technology is disabled, not the people. The technology, just the fact we don't have, we should be able to just sort of pop on robotic legs or, or exoskeletons or whatever, and, and then, then the problem is solved. And until that happens... Yeah, because essentially, you know, either currently in, or in a few years, many forms of amputation will be essentially a non-issue in terms of actual function. But there was um, uh, a runner, she's, a, she's, a, she's a, an athlete, basically, and she was born without, I think, the main bones in her lower leg, so she, she is a below-the-knee amputee, but basically yeah. from birth. So she sort of learned to compete in the in in the real world, and then sort of and then discovered they call the Paralympics and and, yeah, and that kind of stuff, and was sort of like, wait a second, you know, how does this work? I've been competing with 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 people who don't have disabilities. Now I'm competing with people with disabilities. And she was she has a very funny story about she was on the she was on the supposed to be doing a race, a 200 meter race or something, and they called all of the, the people on to get on the bus to drive to the to the stadium and she got on the bus and every single person except her was a hand who was missing a hand and she had two legs on they were all participating in the in the running race and just she was just like what this is this, this, in a way there's an intersection between the medical and the social uh, approach to to uh, to disabilities but I love your technological one because I think that's that definitely speaks to upgrade required for sure and again because essentially certain disabilities are closer to being sort of solved than others. You know, cochlear implants for the deaf mm -hmm. are pretty sophisticated, whereas retinal implants for the blind are very, very crude. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all about looking at an individual's case and saying, okay, what are the overlaps between society, the actual condition, and the technology currently available? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and even look at the aging population, the fact that now they can get around in a scooter system that's cheap enough and, and um, sort of nimble enough to, to navigate even non-urban environments. Um, so all of a sudden, people are able to get around in a way that they couldn't before. They would have been stuck at home before. Now they're able to sort of zip around and, and actually get stuff done. Um, so it's, it's, a change, it's a constantly changing thing, and as the technology changes, I, I, I mean, it really is the ultimate goal, obviously, is rendering all disabilities obsolete through technology. Um, that is obviously going to take some time, but, and again, as you say, depending on the disability. About, the other thing I thought you would find interesting, because I, I see a similarity here between, with you and Stella, was, um, you know, you got your start on YouTube doing a, a lot of sort of uh, debunking of, of uh, anti-evolutionary thinking and organizations. She spoke at uh, an atheist convention in 2012. Oh, really? 
And I've been an atheist for a long time, ever since I first heard that there was only a stairway to heaven. <laughs> I just thought it was such a, again, a clever, a clever sort of take on it. But um, she was quite, from the sound of it, quite a fierce atheist as well. Um, yeah. And she seemed to love her technology as well. She loved that wheelchair, like just, yeah. Um, you know, uh, as I guess, I mean, I guess you, 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 I mean, you don't like yours though, do you? You're not, you're not a huge fan of yours, or? I mean, I like it. It gets the job done. Right. But it's not the accessor. Right. So what else we got here? So we talked about, uh, well, she also, the thing we talked about earlier, which again is a phrase that she used, I think again for the shock value, it was disability porn, she called it. The yeah, idea of inspiration porn. Inspiration porn. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's, oh, okay. I read an article later where she referred to it as disability porn, but inspirational uh, porn, yeah, is, was the, basically the idea of like showing a picture of somebody who's in a worse situation than you to make yourself feel better. I need, right. I, I, I do agree with her sort of opinion on it, but it's, so bottom on my list right. of things to be like outraged or even concerned about. Right, right. I feel like she was almost like a comedian who was forced into activism because of the things that that that, that bothered her so much. I mean, she obviously mm -hmm. these these things really bothered. Once she has a story about she was she wanted to be a teacher and she went in and she did the the interview and they said, well, you can't reach the blackboard. And she's like, what? You're telling me this day and age is not technologies? That I don't need a blackboard to be a good teacher. Um, you know, so she fought against that stuff as well, which was interesting. So she was obviously, and again, being as outspoken as she was, I, I imagine she almost needs to go into activism because I, I imagine she ruffled a few feathers in the, in the process. I mean, she said herself that there was, she, the, the Twitter she found, she got sort of like taken to task for many things. And again, it's a subject, I mean, I find myself, again, I find myself a little bit sort of, Sort of tiptoeing around because I don't know what the right things to say are and what that you know. But again, I feel like you don't. I, I want to be able to have frank discussions about this stuff. So okay, as a disabled person, mm. I'll give you full permission to say whatever you want because <laughs> obviously I have the power to do that. All right, great. Well, look. So I think that's Stella Young covered. Do we have a question for people? Maybe get back to us on on um, on what, how how you feel about this. What what, what are other yeah. people's take on this? I, I again, ideally. As always, I think with, with you and I, our interest lies in the technology, mm -hmm. almost less than the, than, the, than the whole sort of stigma side of it. You almost want to know more about the, the, uh, the, the, the technological solutions rather than the societal problems. Yeah. Yeah, so then, until we geek again, cheerio.